uh, series. Oh, thank you. And we are going to be recording. We are going to be recording this to post it onto our um, AWA plus D YouTube. Um, this is part of our mentorship sessions, and uh, we're looking forward to getting into it. If you're interested, um, you can always become an ADA, AWA plus D member, and then you get these um, these for free. So we'll talk more about membership. But let me cut to the chase and get into our panelists. So today we have a, lot, a wide range of um, very talented women, all within the architecture, construction, and ownership side of things. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves, starting with our AWA, AWA plus D president, Meg Coffey. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Meg Coffey. I am a landscape architect, and I have my own practice. And this year is the 10th. Uh, we're celebrating our 10th anniversary of being in office. So that's exciting. Um, and yes, I'm also president of AWA plus D and I also teach landscape architecture for UCLA extension and do other myriad of things. Thank you, and Stephanie. Hi, I'm Stephanie Hobbs. I'm a principal at ECG Management Consultants. I work primarily in the cancer space and do a, a lot of work um, with Kirsten and her group at ECG in facility design, transition planning, programming. Um, prior to that, I worked in an academic healthcare system for a long time where I was a vice president. And in that role, I was uh, owner's rep, um, as well as owner's rep in um, some uh, consulting uh, work as well. And also, in addition to working full-time with ECG, um, I am president of a, a subcontracting uh, company. We do commercial concrete, but I bring a perspective um, from the uh, contractors as well. Thank you. And Jennifer. Hi, my name is Jennifer Charles. I'm an architect. Um, right now, I'm a sole practitioner. I've been a sole practitioner for about 14 years. And before that, I worked for a variety of architecture firms, architecture and landscape firms um, in Los Angeles and New York City. Um, but as a sole practitioner, I tend to focus on small commercial um, and single family residential. And I, I've been doing construction administration really since day one, so almost 30 years. Um, so I'm really excited to be part of this panel. And Aaron. Hi, oh, I heard Senna in the background. <laughs> Sorry, uh, um, apologies. <laughs> Cute French bulldog has joined us. Um, I'm Erin Gallagher. Um, I'm a senior associate at HGA. Uh, we're a multidisciplinary architectural and engineering firm with about 1,100 people across 12 offices. Um, I've, I'm in my 22nd year of architectural practice. Um, for the first maybe uh, 17, 18, I was primarily core and shell working on developer projects, media tech, um, uh, some higher education. And the first five years of my career were in a design architect's office, meaning we oversaw design intent and carried documents only through design development. So it wasn't until a little bit into my career that I really was in charge of administering construction on jobs. And I remember it being very exciting and very daunting. Um, so I know we're going to have a great discussion tonight. And thank you for having me. And, and I'm looking forward to, to having this discussion. Great. So with all of our panelists, here we have different scopes, different backgrounds. And I just wanted to give a little bit of context of why are we talking about this? Erin um, alluded to that this can be kind of a daunting conversation to have, but did you know that only 24% of uh, licensed architects are women? Um, females represented um, in the construction workers are 9%. So when you combine these two, we're really a minority in the construction setting. So how can we navigate this, um, this landscape? So we'll go into what the overall roles are. And I believe we are missing something. There we go. Um, little technical difficulty. Okay, so we have um, 
the roles of, oh, there we go, a nice fade for you, of how the architects and designers um, work with contractors and how we talk about it. So if we could have a panelist from the architecture and design side, what, going into a job site, what are our roles and responsibilities? So I can kind of take this slide a little bit. Um, so the concept that's on the slide is kind of a general um, industry-wide um, set of roles. The AIA has some documents that also describe this. And you can see on the left of the slide, the architects and designers um, are there to observe the construction. They're not there to lead construction or, um, or lead the general contractor. They're there to observe, record the process. And the architects and designers are really in charge of the design team. So all the, cons the con design consultants, the engineers, um, and, and other architects and consultants. And then on the right-hand side, the contractor is really in charge of how the drawings get translated into the built form. And that's what we call means and methods. How does the work actually get done? Um, the contractor's in charge of that. They're in charge of the construction schedule, cost, including cost overruns, um, bidding, cost estimating, and the general contractor is responsible for directing all the subcontractors. And so one of the things to see that split is that, like, for example, the architect should never be directing a subcontractor. There's this kind of sets up a hierarchy, um, which just helps everyone kind of know their role on the job site. And in, and in the middle is where the, the team overlaps. And this is where most of the communication happens. Um, so submittals, requests for information, those are formal documents that the contractor will submit, whether it's a, a mock-up or specifications to the architect for their formal approval. Um, the both architects and the contractors might take turns uh, taking meeting, meeting minutes or leading a meeting, um, writing site visit reports. So the things in the middle tend to be communication between the parties. But the important thing to know about this slide is that um, you, as an architect or designer, it's helpful to know what is your role on the project team. Otherwise, you might find yourself like doing too much or even getting into trouble, um, liability, legal issues. And so that's what this slide really talks about. I do think that there's one, one thing that's missing from this, and that is the architect's uh, role with the client. So the drawings that, so you were hired, so we are hired by the client and it's part of our responsibility to make sure that the contractor is, is building what's in the documents and therefore being fair to, as to what they're charging the client for. And so we're also there not only to make sure that the project is built correctly and per the design, but that the, that the client is protected as well. Right. And Jennifer alluded to it kind of earlier, the AIA documents kind of set this framework up, but it may be counterintuitive, but technically the architect or designer is a neutral party in the, in the phase of construction between contractor and owner. Um, meaning we can't we can't really favor one or the other if design intent is clear in the documents. Um, it can get kind of fuzzy sometimes and and that's I think where your experience and your skills kind of starts to come out. but um, it, it we do have to actually remain a neutral party and that can that can be kind of difficult sometimes. So a key part of our conversations is the owner, so we've talked about the owner, the client, architect, and contractors. So we're calling this the OAC 101. Um, we generally meet once a week and we um, discuss these parties. So um, Aaron, did you want to take this on? 
Yeah, sure. So yeah, OACs are something that when you're in construction, you will be attending, depending on the, the complexity and scope of the project, probably on a weekly basis. And OAC stands for Owner Architect Contractor. And it's the time to, it, it's, it's really for the contractor to keep owner and architect apprised of progress of construction, um, any, any sort of happenings on the construction site. Um, and depending how the OAC gets in, gets kind of agended, it it's really a time to to bring up any issues where those three parties can can discuss around kind of a common table. Um, and it's generally the GC's responsibility to do that. The GC should be responsible for creating um, a set of meeting minutes that they carry from week to week. They should have an agenda together. They should always show the updated construction schedule. They should be sharing site photos to keep everyone apprised of, of what's going on. Um, and actually, I, I kind of missed a key point up here. Um, and it's, it's really slide two. And I know we're probably going to talk about it a little bit more. Um, but this is the notion that, that the architect and the contractor's role in their goal is the same. They want to get the project delivered for the for the owner, for the client. And I think sometimes if you've not done construction administration, there may be a legacy of an adversarial setup between architect and contractor. And I think we should always attend, we always should should meet the GC with the hand extended and, and realizing that we're that we're partners in delivering the same goal. We have to deliver that project and we have to do it together. So this is a time when the OACs are really a time when you can show the owner that you're working well with the contractor, that the contractor's working well with you. Um, and that really starts to talk about communication even before and throughout the week between architect and contractor and really making sure the OAC is um, is a productive time and doesn't get adversarial. Um, I'm kind of going all over the place here, so I'll stop talking that's and, and pitch it off to somebody yeah. else. No, that's perfect. So Stephanie, um, since you kind of straddle both the owner and the contractor side, and even the subcontractor side, um, right. what's your kind of what's your view on the OAC meetings? What are your overall goals? You know, it is assuring that everyone is communicating um, about any issues that come up, the schedule, the costs, overruns, anything that's going on, the status of the project, um, making sure that everyone is hearing the same information. Because I can't tell you how many times there have been miscommunications that have resulted in change orders or other kinds of you know, um, tension that's not necessary if there had just been more communication. So the OAC is a key piece of that to make sure everybody is communicating the same issues and that those meetings happen frequently. They, they don't, 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 you know, think this is the only communication that happens because it is constant. There is constant communications between the GCs, the subs, they're going back to the, the GCs, going back to the architects, going back to the engineers, getting, you know, information and clarification about things that are going on. It's constant. But this meeting, this OAC meeting, is where all of that is brought together and everybody gets on the same page and it's documented going forward. And I would like to add also, I've worked on large projects and very small projects. And I think this framework that's on the slide uh, can apply to all projects, but how it, how it actually is implemented might change from project to project. So like right now, I'm working on some single family homes, which tend to be a little bit looser than maybe a, you know, a high expensive hospital or something like that. But the points on the slide are still very important, even for that smaller project, um, to keep everyone moving in the same direction. And so we, st we also have weekly meetings, but it might be actually on the job site, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where some of the, some larger meetings, projects I've worked on, it wasn't the meeting wasn't necessarily on the job site. It was maybe in a conference room with photographs and that kind of thing. Um, so this applies to projects of all sizes, but it might change depending on what the project is. And just one more thought also, some of the owners, some of the clients are incredibly complicated. We, we build a lot of schools and you're dealing with school districts and you're dealing with public you know, organizations that have to go to their you know, their boards and they have to go to their school district, you know, meetings and to the 
you know, those types of things. So sometimes decisions can take a long time, you know, when there's lots of other folks involved. So just a, just a, a point that, you know, to, to Jennifer's point that there's all different types of projects and they're all handled a little bit differently, but these are the basics around those meetings. Yeah, and I guess we also didn't mention that sometimes the O uh, can kind of be several different entities. Often projects, larger projects might have a third party project manager who represents the owner in these meetings. So that O can kind of take a couple of different forms. So I'd say as a person just entering into a construction site, really identify where everybody is identifying either it being the contractor, the architecture side, or um, the owner to kind of establish what the different perspectives are. We're going to go into, okay, you're on the job site, you belong here, and you have a role to play. And so I'm going to kick that off. Excuse me, I'm not snoring. Um, we have a French bulldog uh, here. So, um, so please, uh, Aaron, if you want to kick it off with how you introduce yourself on a job site. Yeah, um, I this is something I share with everybody and it's not something I did when I first started out, but um, as Abby said, you belong here. I think this kind of starts to get it sometimes imposter syndrome. Sometimes you might feel like, wait a minute, am I, am I, am I, should I be doing this? Am I the right person? Yes, you belong on the job site. You are there because you're the architect or the designer. You're there to execute design intent of the documents. And one of the things I like to do is introduce yourself, obviously, but to me, that's a handshake. And that's a handshake to everybody that you meet, whether it's a subcontractor that might be on a job site meeting, you, you stick your hand out and you sh and you shake it to me that's you know maybe you're not comfortable with that but I think that it establishes your, pre your presence and your confidence <laughs> and it's not like wait who is she what does she do you know I'm I'm the architect I'm the designer I'm with blah 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 shake smile and it shows that you're looking forward to working with them and you've got a presence on that team um that's what I'm most passionate about so I'm going to kick it off to one of the others to pick up some of the other uh points I've been talking for a while So I can kind of pick up the, um, so the know your role, that kind of goes back to the to the um, Venn diagram slide that we looked at. It's just helpful when you're on the job site, part of one of these meetings that you know your role so you don't overstep your boundaries. And it also, I think if I know my role, it also lessens the, the tension and the nervousness because I, I know I don't, I'm not expected to do everything. So I can focus on why I am there. Um, same with knowing, knowing my strengths, you know, I think these are just professional things when you're in a meeting and don't be afraid to assert yourself, um, know your drawings and specifications. I think that's a very, that's one of the primary ones because people will be looking to you to interpret drawings and specifications. You will know more than anyone else there, what the design is. And so that is something you should always be up to speed with your drawings. Um, advocate for a mentor. I think particularly if you're starting out in construction administration and maybe your firm kind of has thrown you, you know, onto a job site and you really don't know what you're doing, before you go there, um, advocate for a mentor, either in your own firm, if it's not, if, if a mentor is not being offered to you, or if sometimes even for me as a sole practitioner, I have a circle of other peers that I might talk to before I start a project or if I'm if I'm in a bind. So identify for yourself who that person's going to be to kind of help help you out. And that will also give you the confidence on the job site that you have someone, even if they're not physically there, that they're someone that can talk to you later about it. Um, don't be afraid to ask questions or ask for clarifications. Uh, job sites are... 100% a learning environment for everyone. You, I love my contractors. I learn so much from them. And because I respect them, they feel like they're learning a lot from me as well. So you ask questions, they'll ask questions, and it just sets up this mutual respect that's really important on the team. And then also part of being confident is, is dressing to feel safe and comfortable on a construction site, which is a very different environment than a corporate meeting or 
you know, going to your office. So definitely think about what you wear and use that as a confidence booster so that you feel prepared and you're part of the team. I know that I always make sure that I have pockets whenever I'm going out mm -hmm. on a construction site. I have my color-coded pens in my pocket. I have all of things. So then I'm able to kind of, you know, every so often you kind of have to duck under things or you have to crawl around or just being able to be movable, looking professional, but movable and able to feel safe on a construction site. Not only that, but wow. your PPE. So yeah. that I have my own. I will say I have my own. It's it's, it's an engineering vest that has all the pockets and things like that wow. in it. You know, you have your tape measures and all your all your <laughs> rulers and all that kind of stuff in it. But I, you know, I have to echo being on site is where you learn. It's where you learn what really happens and how things are really built. You know, you you can't get it in books. You can't get it on paper. You have to see it. And you have to be there with the folks who are doing it and ask those questions. I mean, I've been at 2 a.m. concrete pours, you know, so that I know what a laser screed is, you know, that, that kind of thing, you know. I mean, it's, it, you can't really learn it any other way. So I think, it, it, you know, Echo, it's the best experience there is. But of course, be safe. And if I could add, not just knowing your contractor, but becoming best best friends with your superintendent <laughs> yeah. is going to be the best way to understand what's going on and be able, I used to trade phone numbers with my super mm -hmm. and then Absolutely. I would send him a, like a quick hand sketch. I'm like, I think this is how I want that to work. And he'd be like, okay, well, I can't do that, but let me go take it over to the framer and see what they can do and what they've got. And then they'll send me an updated sketch and they'll be like, would you approve this? And I'd be like, yep, let's go for it. I'll stamp it. Right. 100%. And Sarah, you bring up, and, and Stephanie, you kind of touched on this too. We're not going to know how every single detail gets definitely installed in the field. That's why the knowledge of subcontractors and contractors is, is so key because it's, it's that design intent, right? It's sending that sketch and saying, yeah, I think it looks like this. Oh, we would actually do it like this. That's okay. That's mm -hmm. totally okay that you didn't hit it right on the detail. You didn't hit it right in the drawings. You show intent and, um, and, and you just work through those problems together. And again, I think it points to mm -hmm. developing that relationship with, with the super. And, and in case anybody doesn't know what a superintendent is on the job site, that's- <laughs> Thank <laughs> that's, you, Aaron. I was just about to ask. <laughs> that's Sorry that's about the, that. no problem. That's the member of the general contracting team who oversees all of the day-to-day -day activities on the job site. Um, mm -hmm. Each subcontractor will have a four person that that that's communicating to the superintendent and the superintendent is is your conduit kind of back to the to the rest of the construction team um, on a kind of day to day basis. Um, yeah, I'll stop yeah. there. We could yep, talk about yep. GC teams all day, but I'll stop there. <laughs> we're going to keep it, while, we're gonna keep it pretty basic it. here and um, kind of go in, into what, you know, understanding our perspective of being brand new at a job site. What are some high level things that you can bring to the job site to make you feel confident, make you feel that you are, that you do belong there and how to ask these questions that can be kind of hard to ask. So Stephanie, I, I cut you off, mm -hmm. but what are some some other um, uh, items you mentioned? Your vest, like what are some other yeah. um, things that should you be part of it? Yeah, yeah, your like your, checklist mm -hmm. as I'm getting ready mm -hmm. to be out on site. You've got your hard hat. You've got your your closed toed shoes. You've got your um, your vest that's uh, reflective that really stands out. You know, and a lot of times the superintendents will have a different color than a general laborer. They'll, they'll stand out. The superintendent will stand out and it'll, sometimes they'll have the superintendent on the back. So you'll know who's in charge because they'll stand out and they'll look a little bit different. What I was going to say, though, was occasionally you will have a female project manager or a female GC. So absolutely. We happen. need more. <laughs> yes. We, some of the best project managers we worked with have been females. Yeah. I mean, they're hands down and they work so they just work so hard. 
But of course, that only happens, what, 24% of the time. Is that right? I know. Well, yeah. it makes me realize, did I say he? Did I? I feel like maybe I was falling. I was falling into that trap. <laughs> so, I was falling into that trap. I mean, yeah. it's it's really yeah. easy to do. I happen to be thinking of the superintendent on a particular job I'm working on yeah. now, who is male. But yeah. you're absolutely right. Um, we do and, need and, to be mindful of that. So thank you for, for catching yeah. that, Stephanie. And you, and you know, you guys, I'm, I'm, I'm five foot two. Okay. I'm a five foot two female. I'm very small and very petite, but I will tell you, they know I'm in charge when I'm on the site. They know, they know who's in charge because I carry myself. Oh yes, confidence. they do, Stephanie. Don't they? I met you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm little, but you know, I'm in charge, you know, but that's a confidence. That's a confidence thing. And it's the way you present yourself, you know, and if they don't want to, if they don't want to um, shake hands because of COVID then give them a fist bump, you know, it's all good. You know, but here's who I am and, and here's how we're going to, you know, we're going to work together and we're partners in this. And and one of the things that I do actually is send um, I send care packages to all of our clients and say, thank you for partnering with us. You know, and we look forward to working with you with, you know, Yeti cups and caps and things like that, because it stands out as something different. You know, we're, we really are partnering with you and it sends that message. And I think there are ways to do that, whether it's in person or it's informal, you know, things like that. But I, you know, and and honestly, maybe that's something a female owned company would do and <laughs> equals would, I don't know. You know, I mean, I, I think, it, you know, anything you can do also to stand out, I think it, it, it will benefit you. I think that's a nice touch, Stephanie. Um, well, I think we got our confidence. We got all the things. And we kind of already started talking about this, but what are some other tips and tricks that you can have on the job site? I will start off first, and this kind of goes into the, more of the drawing side of things and not necessarily construction, but get money into your drawings, meaning detail the things that are there, making sure your specifications are there. So then when issues come up, then we we can negotiate some of these um, uh, these change orders or at least the money is there for it to um, to come to fruition. Um, what are other tips and tricks? Um, Meg, I know that you have some what is like the landscape tips and tricks on, that you have on your CA projects? Well, I don't know that I really have any per se, but. You know, my projects are very, my projects are most often small, single family. And so the whole construction team is myself, the owner and the landscape contractor. So there oftentimes is no GC because there's no architectural work going on. And it's just, it's just me, the client and, and the landscape contractor. And so our meetings are very informal, um, I am, I and the client are usually the only women. Um, I have, you know, I try to work with the same contractors. And so I don't always get to do that, but the contractors that I enjoy working with, you know, I've been working with them for 10 years and I've met their wives. I've met their kids. I know all about them. I know when they're sick. I know when their birthdays are, you know, we chit chat and we, you know, I've um, one contractor who I work with all the time. Uh, I had to call him one day because I my bicycle had a flat tire and I knew he had a project in the neighborhood and it was too far for me to walk because it was like five miles from my house and I had to get to a meeting. So I didn't have time to like change my tire. And so I called him and I was like, hey, are you at that project, you know, <laughs> on this such and such street? And he was like, yeah. And I said, well, I'm just down the road. Can you come pick me up <laughs> and take me home? Because I got a flat on my bicycle. And I know you have a truck. Um, and he was like, yeah, Meg, that's fine. I'll be there, you know, in five minutes. So, you know, I have become friends with, with these contractors. And we've helped each other out on things that are not office related or construction related. But one of the tips that I did learn from that contractor in particular is that um, contractors don't always understand drawings. 
And so it's important to kindly educate them that you sometimes have to flip back and forth of sheets and you have to look at the construction plan, not the grading plan when you're constructing. And you have to look at the grading plan and not the construction plan when you're doing grading. And you need to look at the planting plan when you're doing planting, not the construction plan. Um, and then also I've realized that they don't always know what the design intent is. To us, it's really clear and we think that we've communicated it super well in the drawings. And oftentimes it is not as clearly as communicated as we thought it was. So that's kind of my main tip is that, um, you know, really, ex really uh, expressing what that design intent is and like, you know, look, this is, this is the number one thing that's important about this job and whatever we need to do to make sure that that is what is expressed is what's going to drive the rest of our decisions. Um, I also just thought of, uh, I, well, maybe I'll, I'll save that for another. I'll save that for later, but I do have a story and like architect versus landscape architect versus contractor story. Yeah, we'll definitely get into get into that in the next um, questions and scenarios um, section. But um, other tips and tricks. Um, I think we said this multiple times saying, you know, know your specs, know your drawings. And Meg, you brought up a great point of like, referring to the drawings to being like, hey, this is the question. The answer is on, I'm looking at detail one on sheet A1234, what, whatever it may be, but making sure that we're referencing like, hey, this is, this is where I'm getting this information and it's not just coming from my head. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm gonna, Jennifer, what are some other um, tips and tricks that you have for people just out of school, just starting into construction? I think one of the things that I always find important on the job site is this idea of critical path. And I think one thing that anyone going into to CA should know it's very fast paced. It's a very tight team. There's all, you know, it, it's a very hectic schedule to kind of stay up with construction. And, and so a lot of times, um, like on the slide here, if you don't know the answer right away, like how to deal with that. Um, part of what I try to do is find out from them, well, what's the critical path? And that means like what are what are the decisions that need to be made quickly so that it doesn't hold up this whole other thing? Because um, sometimes a contractor will ask you ten questions, and you give them answers to eight of them, but it doesn't. You know they don't really need them right away. They just want the information because it helps them plan. And so that's that's one thing I I always try to back up and ask myself too: Is this a critical path item? And that helps me prioritize what questions to, to try to answer. Um, I think the other thing that I try to do with contractors as well is if something does come up on the job site, uh, some kind of problem, some kind of site, site condition that wasn't expected, something with the supply chain now that we're dealing with, you know, often the people are looking at you to somehow provide an answer. But for some of these things, really it's the contractor it's always nice when the contractor says, okay, we have this pro problem or this issue and here are th like three, three options of how we can maybe solve it. And so then you start working as a team to solve the problem rather than always the contractor coming at you saying, what do you want to do? This is a problem. What do you want to do? So I try to kind of pull everything, uh, kind of deflect some of it back to the, the whole team because oftentimes like we were talking a few slides ago, it's not just the arc, the architect or the design. Some of it is the owner. Is it a bud? Does it affect the budget? Does it affect one of their priorities? Um, the contractor can almost always give you more information about what is what is the actual problem. Like I've had supply chain issues that's held everything up, but we've worked together to no, you can get it from this other vendor, you don't have to go with this vendor that you always 
get it from. And so we're able to kind of work through it. So um, I think the hardest thing is when you kind of feel cornered with a contractor on the spot to, to produce an answer. But I would say as a, an architect's role or designer's role, just kind of like take, take a deep breath and engage the whole team to together solve a problem. And I think that that helps a lot when you're on the job site. And yeah. if you don't know the answer, don't you don't have to commit right then and there. I want to make sure we are all on tight schedules. We are all on tight schedules. But if you're not confident in your answer to whatever questions being um, said, make sure that you ask them to follow up in an email or an RFI, whatever works in your communication strategies in order for you to be able to give yourself that time to look over the drawings and give you give the accurate answer. Right. Yes. And definitely and the, the photo document and take notes. Every time I step on a job site, I'm always taking tons of photographs because it always comes in handy down the road. Um, when you're back in your office in front of the computer, you, you know, you can pull things. So definitely take a lot of photographs when you're on site, take notes, even if you're not the, the official note taker for a particular meeting, make sure you're taking notes for things that you're responsible for so that you can jump right on them. Yeah. And I, I was just gonna, I was gonna say um, about, uh, if you don't know the answer, just following up what Abby was talking about. I had that happen yesterday. Um, I was doing a, actually a FaceTime call CA and it's, it's a, it's a interesting project because we didn't do construction documents and it doesn't matter why, but, um, so the contractor is kind of making up how he's building everything and it's not at all the way I would have done it. Um, and so it's, they're having some issues and the owner had me on FaceTime and she was wanting answers like then and there and it's the front yard and it's the entry to the house. And, and I said, you know, I, I really need to draw this because I just, this is your front door. And I, I just can't make these decisions on the fly. It's too important of a space it's too important of a, of a area and we can't just make these decisions quickly. So I'm gonna need, you know, a few hours to kind of think about this. And, and she was like, oh my God, yes, that, that makes all the sense in the world. And, and you know, and I, I gave her the information that she needed, but she called me back like right after we hung up and she, she had had the contractor there the whole time. And she was like, you know, that conversation we had was so helpful. Like the contractor now understands what the issues are and understands the design intent and understands that there's these other, there are these other options to solve the issue that he hadn't really thought of. So, you know, please go ahead and get us that information that we've asked for, but we're already feeling, you know, so much better of just communicating. Yeah. Um, yeah. So communicate, 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 right? That's the whole point of this. We talked a lot about the OACs, RFIs, submittals, but <laughs> finding out the communication strategies within the larger team, within the contractors, within the owners, within the architecture side, and all of those that are related is really important and critical. So getting to the overall job, which is we all want to complete this job for the owner. I am going to, you know, we're right at um, 740. I want to make sure that we have some really great time. If there's anybody in the audience that has questions for the um, panelists, I also have a few scenarios that we can run through. So I'm going to stop my screen since everybody doesn't quite need to see the big questions out here, but some face-to-face -face time, right? Any comments or questions for the panel? I have a question, can I go first? Yes, you can. Um, so we just won a big contract from a client, a large healthcare organization who has decided to go with everything progressive design build. 
And I'm not used to that. <laughs> I So I was wondering, what is the true nature and difference that I should expect to deal with? Because I, and I deal with the hospital users. I deal with the owner, which means I do touch the architect and the construction people both um, through the lens of the user who's usually like griping about everything they didn't decide upon and don't know what's being built or even how to read architecture plans, right? But so I'm trying to figure out exactly what progressive design build means. So anyone who wants to answer that would be great. I have never heard of progressive design build. So I'm 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 clueless uh, what that what that means over and above a typical design build pro project. <laughs> Sorry. I was going to say that I was going to say the same thing. Is anybody else anybody? heard of the progressive? <laughs> you see Davis that? Health. So they yeah. only have 7 billion to spend. I wonder I wonder if that's a fun little marketing thing I, we're putting out there maybe maybe i'm, I'm dealing with up. this group in gpr on this project so i understand it's design build but mm -hmm. progressive design build i don't know maybe just opening up those communications and um really seeing how like more works. um i i just i not that not that i'm going to answer your question here on the fly <laughs> okay. with google but i just did aia um progressive design build and it looks like it's a thing and there's an article titled what's so progressive about progressive design build and it's written by an attorney <laughs> me, and so so mm -hmm. i mean it's a it's a thing it sounds like it looks like our, our professional organization has something to say about it so that's pretty interesting i'll have to mm -hmm. i'll have to look into that Maybe we okay. might be hearing more about it. Thank you, Jake, in the chat. So I'm just, I'm laughing because I had a conversation with with the construction firm and the owner together. And the first thing he asked me was, what's first day patient care really mean? Can I have half the building not open and just, you know, I was like, first day patient care means everything must be open but or everything must be ready for patient care. But maybe that's what progressive design build is. You can have everything behind the scenes, like not really done or something. So, okay. Thank you. I mean, if it's coming across with no change orders, oh, that's a tough one. Oh, yeah. oh no. That's too Gosh. It is an that feels like a center, so battle maybe. waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, just gonna be honest there i would vote no no change <laughs> orders that's a new one right Oof. that might be too progressive <laughs> thank progressive you for the for laughing at my joke any so, other comments or oh yeah go ahead Stephanie. i was gonna say kirsten according to google <laughs> Y'all don't have to Google it for me. Come on. Progressive design build brings the contractor in early. Oh, he's been he's been along for a it while. It allows the design oh. and construction team to collaborate during the earliest stages because you know the contractor's not always brought yeah. in during the design phase. Right. Right. So that means it's progressive in that they're bringing in the contractor early. So why is he asking me what patient care day is? He should already know. Um, joke, joke. Maybe they don't do a lot of healthcare projects. I don't. They do. Okay. <laughs> Not only um, the client. Okay. One thing I was going to mention, if unless there's a question in in the audience, um, and maybe it Go went with it. our tip and trick slide. But um, if you ever want to be able to read a contractor's mind, and this also applies to an owner, it's really three things. It's scope, schedule, and cost. And okay. if ever, exactly, if you're ever, and issues are going to come up, and there's going to be competing solutions and competing needs, but the contractor is going to want to know, the first thing that they're going to say is scope, what needs, what needs to happen, schedule, how fast do I need to do it? And three, cost, did I buy this in a lump sum contract? Am I paying for this? Or is this something that the owner's going to pay for? And those three things, um, and Stephanie, you're from the contracting mm -hmm. community, so yeah. I, I think I'm, I'm probably right in this. If you yeah, can absolutely. put yourself, <laughs> if, if you can put yourself in those shoes and, mm -hmm. and anticipate how they're going to be thinking about a, a, an issue from that perspective, your communications are going to really go a long way. And I, I think you're going to get to a problem problem solving a lot 
a lot faster. Um, it also kind of signals a little bit of empathy that you get the boat that they're in and you know, you realize you have a role to play in the solution. And uh, I, I just, one of my mentors told me that and it's it's just one of those things that's like written written on my heart. Well, maybe not my heart, but you know, it's, it's, it's just something that's been a mantra of mine throughout my career in dealing with contractors. Well, and I've, I've heard that same, that same, uh, the same three things, but even beyond that is that you're, and I hate to say never, but you're probably never going to have all three that you can have two, but you, but one of them is always going to lose. So you might be able to, that's right. It for the, the yep, scope yep. and the cost, but it's going to add, add time to the schedule. Or, you know, so there's always going to be one of those three that's going to lose out. So exactly. It, it's, yeah. So again, you know, it's helpful to know what, which one of those is really the priority for the client and for the contractor. And, you know, what I've always thought is interesting is we, is it, it inherent within the construction process is sort of a, uh, we're at odds because the contractor wants to make the most amount of money and the client wants to spend the least amount of money. So we're butting heads already mm -hmm. and that makes it really challenging. Well, and the faster we can get it done, the um, better. Right, exactly. The right. more money we can right. make, right? Yeah. Yes. And, so and I made those decisions quickly and yeah. yeah. Not in California. <laughs> <laughs> Misha, I saw you have your hand raised. Did you have a question for us? Yeah, I, real quick. Uh, you know, you, we talked about the early slides about design intent. And especially now I've noted with, with BIM, we turn over to the BIM model, our engineering model to the contractor. And there's the expectation of a certain amount of coordination that's going to need to take place with the, with the contractor and their subcontractors. And it's, I don't know if I say battle because that sounds confrontational, but the, 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 there's a certain amount of what our intent or our expectations are of design intent and not getting a bunch of RFIs during construction for shifting a duct two inches or a light fixture over an inch or something like that. It's just, <laughs> I, I don't know any suggestions on how to set those expectations or whatever would be greatly appreciated. So, I, I think you're right, Misha. I think it's setting expectations in you know before construction begins, um, and obviously if if design uh, and designers and architects are going to be trading their BIM models over to the contractor, there's always a ton of language in our agreements that say what can be expected out of that model and what can't be expected out of that model. Um, Ultimately, I think you can always rest on the fact that the contractor it doesn't absolve the contractor of their responsibility to deliver a coordinated um, installation. Um, now, I, I realize that that doesn't always work when you're kind of, you know, getting into into needly discussions. Um, I don't know if any of the other panel have any specific thoughts on that. No, but it looks like um, <laughs> I, can, I can kind of touch it's on that. Um, I've yeah. done a lot of, especially now that I've been at HOK, I've done a lot of the design team is there. And then at about end of DD, somewhere between end of DD and 50% CDs, the contractor, because we're a it's a design build project, switches out the engineering model for the subcontractor model. And that's when we start that's when the subs take our design intent and start really nailing down like, okay, does the sprinkler line, can it shift four inches east and then two inches down? Cause we need those sprinklers to be under the electrical, not above the electrical conduit. And, and that's, it's a wonderful process. I've been in all those meetings for my last two projects and it's just, it's fascinating and terrifying all at the same time. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. So I think it's just, it's, yeah, I think like Erin, you were saying, it's the managing expectations and understanding that our engineering and design models are intent. They are not 
you know, to the quarter eighth inch. That being right. said, no contractors building me anything to the quarter or eighth inch. So right. don't expect my model to be to the quarter or eighth inch anyway. Right. And you'd mentioned a project delivery method design build where that risk sharing happens between the designers and the contractor, um, which kind of mitigates that a little bit, I would imagine. Has that been your experience? Because they're, yeah. everybody's kind of in the same boat of risk there. Um, when it gets turned over, when it's a classic kind of design bid build, um, Misha, maybe that's the, the project yeah. delivery method you were kind of thinking where this gets a little dicey. It, it gets a little dicey when at times we're not underneath the architect, we're underneath the subcontractors. And there's a, a, a little bit different loyalty there, <laughs> so to speak, you, you know, with, yeah, that, it, and if, yeah, and we, and you work with these architects and other projects, you know, so it's, you're, you're very cognizant of, you don't want to make the architect mad, but at the same time, you're, you're working for a, a, a sub, a subcontractor on the project, so. Yeah. Uh, Jake, I see yep. you have your hand up. Hi, thank you. Um, great panel, uh, really good information. Um, I I do feel like maybe this got sidestepped or is maybe a bigger deal speaking as a man on on construction sites where my whole career I've always had women design teams, women architects, women project management, working on the pro helping do the CA, all that kind of stuff because I'm focused in workplace TI. However, I think I've never, I've yet to have a female superintendent or female uh, uh, subs and trades, anybody in the field. And so oh, we missed out tonight. It, it's been an interesting experience though of, of there is a sense of like proving yourself that I've, I've seen and I've tried to mentor around that uh, in the field that's beyond the fist bump or the handshake. And, and especially for, for junior designers just entering the field and kind of getting that comfort level, you know, one, I'd be curious if, if that had happened to the esteem panel of trying to have to validate yourself beyond just coming in with the gumption and the confidence and all of that, which goes a, a long way, don't get me wrong, but also, you know, how can, how can allies, advocates, colleagues help create that space with, you know, without undermining the role of the PA, you know, and stepping in, like, that's a very nuanced relationship where you really want the person in the field to have the trust and the confidence and the voice to, to speak to controlling the project. So that's like a very tricky thing as a manager and helping your team and empowering um, and leading. So I'm just, you know, that's a, a topic that I would love to hear about, however you want to take what I just said into whatever direction, but. Well, I think for I'll I'll speak as an architect who's been doing construction administration since the very you know since I kind of first started. I think one thing that I have found is, and it's been kind of touched on before, is like make the superintendent your best friend. You know, so it might be like initially maybe that person will be surprised, you know, that you are the architect or the designer, but pretty quickly if you're being professional and you know what you're doing like that that's gone the gender is gone and um but i think it's hard if you have to have that same introductory kind of back and forth with every subcontractor with every vendor um people that you don't see all the time that you might only see for you know a short window but the way that the hierarchy is set up you should always be going through the superintendent anyway through the general contractor so i i have always used that to my advantage because as soon as the superintendent is on my side, I don't have to do anything. He's the one that if, if he feels like a sub is not giving me respect, I've had superintendents say, whoa, you know, so-and-so, like, this is the architect. Like, you need to do it. You know, she's telling us how, you know, how to solve this problem. That's how we're doing it, you know, or this is the architect. The owner, you know, hired this person to, to do the design. So don't be questioning her. So I think that's one thing that I, I would probably, as kind of a, a tip for someone is kind of figure out who on the job site is leading the different things. And if you align yourself with that person, that kind of trickles down to the rest of the job well, site. I mean, I can speak from, you know, a subcontractor contractor perspective. And I think it's, it's our job to help educate the details around our trade. 
right? This is why we're doing what we're doing. This is why we're questioning that and to really partner with everybody in that and to help everybody understand. So for example, we're concrete, right? It's complicated. It doesn't seem like it would be, but it's incredibly complicated. There's lots of different mixed designs. There's lots of different approaches to it. There's, you know, anyway, it's, it's complicated. So we take the time to help answer the questions and educate people so that they understand why we're doing what we're doing. And, and if we ask those questions, why we're asking. So I think having the right, you know, subs and the right GCs in place that not only, you know, see you as a partner, but help you understand some of that, um, what's happening in the field so that it becomes real to you. You're not only seeing it, but they're explaining why, you know, and a lot of that you get in school, but, but a lot of it you get directly from the subs who are doing it every day. And I think that's important. You've got a good sub who's going to help you understand, you know, the details of their trade. You don't need it from everybody, but there are certain trades you really need to understand. Need to understand. That's my my perspective. I would, you know, coming from my role. And I would say, if you're looking for the women and gender nonconforming people on the job site, they're in electrical and fine carpentry. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you're absolutely I'm right. Like, Unfortunately, yeah. uh, my friend Kat wasn't able to make it. She's a super with Turner Construction. Um, oh, yeah. Her wife, her oh, wife okay. had um, a surgery recently, so that she wasn't able to make it. But um, she's been a super with several large. She does airports now, I guess. She's working on San Diego Airport. Um, so it's fascinating to go on site and watch her just be yeah. this, this tiny woman who is a superintendent of this massive project. And every single 60-year-old man who's on that site is like, yes, Ms. Osborne. Yes, Ms. Osborne. <laughs> That's great. That's interesting. You mentioned that, Sarah. The other trade I've seen um, I've seen uh, women in is, and I think it's because they were just thin on the ground, was union welders. I've been on uh, two job yes, sites with, 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 yeah. with female welders. And I, I mean, I, I think that's I think that's pretty badass, actually. <laughs> you know I, mean? I think that's really cool. Um, but um, I, I, I think, you know, Jake, you ask a really good question, and it, it kind of goes back to mm -hmm. kind of a psychological game that I think, unfortunately, a, a lot of women and minorities have to play with themselves to get out of imposter syndrome. And um, a lot of it, and I think we took this, the, the, uh, the phrase out of the presentation, Abby, but fake it till you make it. Sometimes that's what we have to do, but but honestly, it's true, and it's it's why we put up there on that slide. You belong here. You belong here. Always tell yourself that. You, you no one's giving you permission to be there. Oh, aren't I lucky to be here? You have a role on that job site, and if you have to tell yourself that twenty times, if you have to tell yourself why is this guy looking at me like like just. Just whatever mm -hmm. game you have to play. Um, sometimes we have to do that. Um, maybe I'm making it sound worse than it is, but you know, I think we've all experienced it. Um, I, I don't know. It's kind of no. it's kind of my thought on it. I think well, I think you're totally right. I think it's it's that confidence. It's um, almost natural that yeah. we'll be a little more timid and just being. Mm -hmm. That's really a big hurdle. I know before every construction site. I go on to, I have like a pump up mix to like, yeah. be like, yes, I know this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know that my bosses are on this call. So there we go. Um, but <laughs> that is my, that's my, like, I, I need to build that up so then people can have confidence in me and doing, mm -hmm. doing this job. And um, I can't remember the specific statistics. So please um, uh, uh, bear with me, but it along the lines of women need to feel a hundred percent I'm saying something, whereas um, men may um, be less than that. And so they tend to be more um, vocal in this situation. This is an amazing conversation. And we are so close to eight o'clock, but I do see DeMario's hand up. We, we can do one more question and I think we can wrap it up. Is that okay? Uh, actually, Great is, though. Uh, hey, DeMario. Actually, hey, how are you all? <laughs> good, good. good. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for the comments. I, I was trying to lay low, but uh, when I heard the mm -hmm. comment about the electrical being non-gender conforming, being an electrical engineer, I had to jump in and just say something that uh, <laughs> we need to keep those comments kind of low. I don't <laughs> think we're that bad, but uh, <laughs> you know, that's how you feel. I'm messing with you. That's how you feel. That's how you feel. I didn't realize it was electrical. So I guess I'll be a little bit more cognizant of that uh, as I work 
with the electrical, I guess the contractors and the engineers as well. So thanks for bringing that to the surface. Yeah, I think it's just a because like I say, these union trades were just really thin on the ground. So it's allowed a lot of women to, allowed isn't the right word, but it's it's caused a lot of women to enter the workforce. And I think it's fantastic. And I know we're up at eight o'clock, so I'll shut up. <laughs> well, thank you all again for coming and adding into it. I'm also, thank you so much for our allies coming in. And thank you again to our fabulous, uh, panelists and describing all of these things. This is really helpful and we'll get the confidence to be out on the construction site. Um, just as a heads up, so for AWA plus D, we do have a few things coming up. If you are um, an experienced professional, 10 or years, uh, 10 years or up, um, that we have on uh, February 15th, Cocktails and Conversations. Um, we also have started a study accountability group. So if you are studying for any of your exams, um, landscape, architecture, interior design, um, it's a really great platform that you can go in and um, vent or maybe just do a study, study guide. Um, and for those who are self-employed business owners, we do have a morning coffee on the 22nd. Um, keep an eye out on AWA plus D um, for any other events. Um, as I mentioned early on in this, we will be having an in-person mentor mixer um, in, at HGA. So keep an eye out for that. And thank you all for coming. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks.